the National Assembly. In France, this is where laws are decided and voted. For the lobbies, these pressure groups that try to influence and persuade politicians, this is a strategic place. They say that they are everywhere, that they are very powerful, and that they can even change laws. We spoke to the elected members. Uh, we're making a program on lobbies at the Assembly. Are there any here? No, I don't see them, but they, they certainly are here. Are there lobbyists in uh, the Assembly? Have you come across them? Have they been to see you? Not to my knowledge. I've never met any. But what, what, what do you mean by a lobbyist? I don't know. Uh, are there lobbyists? I don't see them. In any case, if I did see them, I'd tell them, you're not welcome here at the Assembly. The members don't seem to see them. And yet the lobbyists are certainly there, in the four-column lobby, in the very heart of the assembly. The man in the striped shirt promotes the interests of the textile industry. This one works for a major cigarette manufacturer. And hiding between two doors is the lobbyist for hunters and gunsmiths. So who are they really? How do they work? We're going to take you into the highly secretive world of these networks of influence. to measure suit, a physique like Paul Newman. Thierry Cost is a lobbyist. He set up the offices of his firm, Lobbying and Strategy, in the capital's chic district, a stone's throw from the ministries and the National Assembly. Well, when you enter Thierry Cost's office, you know you're taking risks. <laughs> Well, it's not a military weapon, it's a hunting weapon. I have the reputation of being a very good shot, a very good sniper. A telescopic sight rifle in the closet and trophies on the wall. For Thierry Cost, hunting is a passion, but it's also his stock in trade. He's the lobbyist for the powerful National Federation of Hunting. His greatest feat of arms Jean Saint Josse's presidential campaign in 2002. 1,200,000 votes, a historic result that made his reputation. I'm very clearly seen as a troublemaker number one on hunting bills. Thierry Cost works alone. He has a small lobbying firm, just two employees. However, he represents the interests of major clients, retailers, the food industry, and gun makers. I help my clients earn money, win market share, or formulate opinions which are clear relative to legislation or regulations for hunters. Lobbyists work in the shadows and love secrecy. Thierry Cost is the only one who agreed to lift a corner of the veil over his profession. This morning, he's invited to a conference on hunting. But first, he has to make an important phone call. I'm going to try and call an advisor to Dominique Bussero because I need to get some information before I go to the meeting. Dominique Bussero is the Minister of Agriculture. Well, what information do you need? I need to know what decisions have been made on bird flu. He has a cell phone number of one of the minister's advisors. Listen, I've got a, a conference where they're going to talk about hunting waterfowl, so it's uh, not very important, but they may talk about bird flu. What are the latest political considerations? Oh, so you're lifting everything. Oh, the farmers will kiss you. So there's a ministerial meeting this evening at Matignon. Well, listen, thanks much for the, uh, for the info, and I'll try to be discreet at the conference. I owe you a good meal, so uh, give me a call. Allez, salut. 
So when you're a good lobbyist, you can call a minister's advisor directly and talk to him just like that? Well, yeah, we're familiar with them. To reap, you have to sow. That advisor has become something of a friend. Did he give you some important information? Yes, but I can't really spread it around. I'll use a little of it uh, just now at the conference, because the information that I have won't be made public until 6 o'clock this evening, during a meeting in the Prime Minister's office. Exclusive information obtained thanks to a well-filled address book. That's the basic tool of the lobbyist. A few minutes later, he arrives at the National Assembly, where the Hunting, Fishing, Nature and Tradition Party is organizing a conference on hunting waterfowl. Everybody says hello. Thierry Coste is well known to them. But what they don't know is that Thierry Coste is on a commissioned assignment. Today he's not working for the Hunting Party, but in the pay of the UMP. Yves, how are you? It's been a long time. But to look at him, you'd never guess. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, how are you? <laughs> he says hello to everybody. <laughs> a little kiss, a handshake or a pat on the cheek. It's all part of his strategy. It's cost me and it's going to cost me some more. The debate is underway. At the back of the room, Thierry Coste doesn't really seem interested. The UMP wants to know if the hunters are going to put forward a candidate for the 2007 presidential elections. To get that information, Thierry Coste is on the lookout for an informant, whom he very quickly spots. He's this activist in the hunting party. He takes him to the end of the corridor. What I can tell you for your job, if it will help, is that when you go and talk with Sarkozy's people, you can confirm that there will be a hunting party candidate. 100% sure. Absolutely sure, sure, sure. Uh, who will it be? Have you already picked him? No, no, not yet. Uh, well, there won't be that many candidates anyway, surely. Well, we suggested that Jean-Louis went for it, but uh, he didn't want to. Uh, so that's where we are now. Well, listen, uh, this is just between you and me. Well, you know everything. No, no, it's between just you and me. The information will be official two months later. The hunting party will actually put a candidate forward in the 2007 presidential elections. An electoral prospect that Thierry Coste, as a good lobbyist, owes it to himself to foresee. Well, you have to have good relations with everybody. That's a must for, for a lobbyist. That's why, uh, looking forward to 2007, I'm re-establishing a lot of contacts with the left. Well, you think uh, things might turn? Well, there's a good chance, yes. And a few minutes later, there's Thierry Coste joking with a communist member. <laughs> you seem to be on very good terms. Oh, we've known each other for some time. <laughs> but do you know what he does? Do you know what he does? No, no. Tell me. I'm a political advisor to the hunting world. I'm the hunter's lobbyist. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. That's how we met. He's a lobbyist as well. He's what? A lobbyist? Ah, uh, well, it's, uh, it's a word I don't particularly like. Uh, it has bad connotations. But I find that people who are, who are passionate about something, uh, who know, uh, who have relations with the decision makers, uh, with the business sectors, well, people like that are, are important. Uh, you don't think that as a member of parliament you're being manipulated? Well, you're only manipulated if you want to be. <laughs> Another important moment in the lobbyist's day, lunch. Today, Thierry Coste has invited a UMP member, Jean-Claude Lemoyne, and he takes him to a famous Parisian restaurant. Hello, how are you? 
Is uh, Jean-Philippe there? Okay. We're at Tante Marguerite, one of the favorite tables for parliamentarians, and only a stone's throw from the National Assembly. Thierry Cost has his habits. Well, it's not my usual table, that, it's that one over there. And from that one, you can see everyone who comes in and everybody who goes out. Mr. Chairman, the owner comes over in person to say hello. <laughs> And here's what's behind Thierry Cost's invitation. He is preparing a campaign against the animal rights movement, so he has a little favor to ask of the member. Listen, I'm writing the strategy for, for animal welfare from uh, all its facets, bullfighting, hunting, force feeding of, of geese, uh, foie gras, etc. Uh, because I saw not long ago that the city of Chicago has banned the sale and even the possession of foie gras. Uh, if that happens here, then we're really stuffed. The campaign is financed by the Hunting Federation, but Thierry Coste needs the support of a known political personality. He thought of the former minister for national education. It really needs uh, your pal uh, Luc Ferry to get this thing uh, going, because he's good. Luc Ferry, pardon. Voilà. Puisse commencer à s'approprier ça. Oh, I have very fond memories of that chap. He has a very pretty wife. Il est très jolie femme. Il est très mauvais. Well, he was a very bad as a, as a politician, but very good as a philosopher. That, that's certainly true. He's a very good channel of opinion, but we really have to get this off the ground in the next two months. Là, dans les deux mois à venir. Tout à fait d'accord. The member is willing to contact Luc Ferry, but on one condition. So what are you going to do for my uh, electoral campaign? Uh, the first thing I would have to do, even before considering becoming your campaign manager, is, is to visit your uh, constituency. Uh, but you're always on holiday. But uh, when you come, you'll be my guest. We just have to find a date when I'm, when I'm there too. Allez, Jean-Claude, je te fais pas la bise, mais le cœur y est. Je vais prendre ta serviette. Ah, ben oui. The check, around 100 euros, is picked up by Thierry Cost. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. After lunch, it's off to the National Assembly. It's here that Thierry Cost principally promotes his client's interests. However, lobbyists have no right to enter. Officially, our lobbyists don't have the right to enter the assembly. How do you do it? C'est un badge de collaborateur. Well, I have a parliamentary advisor's badge. The advisor's badge bears the name of a UMP member, Thierry Mariani. He gave it to Thierry Coste, a badge that is worth its weight in gold and allows him to enter parliament completely legally. On this point, the assembly rules are very strict. Lobbyists are banned from the four-column lobby. But Thierry Coste doesn't hide. He's a regular here. When he greets members, he calls them by their first name. Maxime is Maxime Grimetz, Communist Party member. Charles Amadé de Courson, UDF, the right of center party. And André Santini, also UDF. saint jos announced that uh, he wasn't leaving, but they can't prevent themselves saying that uh, he is leaving. So on September the 2nd, they're going to try and find a candidate. Thierry Coste meets Thierry Mariani, a UMP member who gave him the badge. He is the first to get the information on the presidential candidate that Thierry Coste obtained at the hunting conference. I'm going to give you all the information by Friday. End of conversation. We approach Thierry Mariani to ask him why Thierry Coste passes himself off as his parliamentary assistant. Is this where you meet your parliamentary advisors? Uh, from time to time, uh, yes, uh, but I wasn't talking to one of my parliamentary advisors then. That gentleman isn't your parliamentary advisor? Well, yes, we work together from time to time on certain matters, in particular rural questions. And it's true, in my constituency, issues relating to hunting, rural problems, are very important. So he's also your parliamentary advisor? Yes, quite. Uh, he works with me on rural subjects. We, we, we have several advisors. I have an advisor who specializes in the Law Commission. I have people I work with relating to certain matters, and Thierry Coste is also one of the people I work with, particularly in relation to hunting. 
des personnes avec lesquelles je travaille, notamment sur les dossiers de chasse. The explanation is rather hazy. Badges of convenience are common at the assembly. All the lobbyists that we meet seem to have one. Uh, who do you work with? Oh, I work with companies, businesses, but they're very discreet here. Uh, when you work for a business, how do you manage to get into this hall? Do, do you have a badge? That's a secret. I won't tell anyone. I never speak to reporters. The lobbyist might be suspicious of reporters, but our subject interests him. He's a curious person. So when we question members about lobbies, he stays around and listens to our conversation. Yes, there are lobbyists, uh, but I don't get the impression that they have the same position as in the European Parliament or other international parliaments. Well, what does that mean? Well, they're less present. They're less present, or are they just more discreet? No, no, I think there are just less of them here. And the two men go off arm in arm. But does Claude Bartolone really know whom he's dealing with? Is that gentleman with you a lobbyist? I don't know if he's a lobbyist. We have a private uh, relationship. We've had a friendly and private association for a number of years. Yes, members and lobbyists don't like to be seen together. Meanwhile, Thierry Cost is using his presence at the assembly to sort out another matter. This time the client is a retailing brand. And this member from the right may be able to help him. When you've got half a minute, uh, I, I need to see you. The member demanded that he be pixelated. The conversation that follows is slightly embarrassing for him. So you know uh, that I work as a lobbyist for, for Carrefour, huh? right? Well, no, I didn't know that. Well, we, uh, anyway, we need a direct contact with Robien. I work for the person in charge of development at Carrefour. And uh, he has a project for an extension of a hypermarket that he wanted to put to Gilles de Robien. But the problem is that now he no longer works directly with Gilles de Robien, but uh, just with his team. Well, the man you need to see is... Uh, who is he? Well, at the moment, he's director of international relations at the Minister of Education. He's uh, Gilles de Robien's office manager and has been his senior advisor at the Ministry of Education until he uh, became the director. But he has his eye on what's going on in uh, Amiens. Well, okay, I'll call him. And if you ever feel you're not getting through, you'll get the office manager on the phone, a, a, a woman. Uh, if you see you're not getting anywhere and he doesn't answer you, tell me. Okay, thanks, right. At the moment, Thierry Coste's network consists mainly of politicians from the right. That makes sense, since they are the ones in power. Political personalities in power, whom we find classified by case in Thierry Coste's office. We see the names of members, of ministers, the prime minister, and even the president of the republic. Well, there we are. We see Jacques Chirac, Dominique de Villepin. Uh, can you tell us what's in there, or is it confidential? Well, it has to remain a little bit confidential. But sometimes members and governments change, and certain files find themselves stacked on shelves at the end of the corridor. Well, those on that side, uh, there, are more or less on, on hold. The Hervé Gamin or the Jean-Pierre Raffarin. They're there because, for the moment, they're less active. I have areas where some people are less active than others. But these are, these are all cases I've done lobbying on. I lobbied the Prime Minister because I was close to somebody close to the Prime Minister. Uh, sometimes uh, I promoted the, the Prime Minister in the area of uh, influence strategy. For, for example, the Prime Minister set out his rural strategy in an article for a newspaper called uh, The French Hunter. But uh, it was never done because his communications people were, were, all, were all against it. But they did forget that it's a paper that only partly deals with hunting and which is very rural and has a print run of 600,000. And it's read by 3 million people. 
So it was more important to talk about rural politics in that paper than, say, in Le Monde. But the uh, political microcosm that surrounds French politicians has a tendency to put out information via the Libération, Le Monde and, and Le Figaro. So uh, you were behind that one? Yes, because it enabled me to maintain an important contact with the paper because I needed it for, for other clients. I did them a favor. The editor-in-chief was very pleased. It was the first time that he'd had a, an exclusive interview with, uh, with a prime minister. And that makes reporters rather nice towards me. It's a, form, uh, it's a form of influence, you know. And it's thanks to these various contacts that he can bill very highly for his services. Industrialists or the hunting federation pay from 30,000 to 200,000 euros a year. I don't need to make my reputation. I'm expensive. And I work because of the money. I don't work because of the ideas. Because, as everybody knows, a lobbyist doesn't work for his ideals. And that's the reason why often people turn to lobbyists on contentious issues. Wine. In 2004, the wine growers' lobby launches an attack on the Evin law, which limits advertising on alcohol. After a struggle of several months, the lobby wins the battle and obtains a relaxation of the Evin law. The fight against obesity. In 2005, the government tries to remove snack vending machines from schools. The food industry lobby launches an offensive. But this time it fails. Finally, tobacco. Since 2005, there's been open warfare over a proposed law banning smoking in public places. Two lobbies confront each other. Those who are against the law, the tobacco industry those who are for it, the pharmaceutical industry. Because the more you ban smoking, the more nicotine patches you sell. As you can see, lobbyists are prepared to invest very considerable means to manage and develop their network of influence. Lourmarin, one of the loveliest villages in the Louberon. On this September morning, a strange ballet of cars makes its way to the chateau. For several hours, minibuses and huge limos come and go, bringing more than 200 guests. At the same time, just a few miles away, they are busy preparing a gala dinner in this classified 12th century abbey. While they tune the grand piano, waiters set up dozens of tables. Because this prestigious place is where the 200 guests at the chateau will come to eat. So much activity is unusual in Lumarin, and yet here, nobody knows anything about it. Do you know what's going on up at the chateau now? Uh, today? No, not really. Do you know about it or, or not? No. Maybe there's a film being shot or a, or a wedding. Oh, there are so many things that go on there, it's, it's hard to say. Exceptionally, the chateau is closed to the public. A three-day conference on medication is being held in camera. It's called a pharmaceutical summer school. But this school is not open to the public, nor to reporters. But this is what we do manage to film. On the terrace, the upper crust of the pharmaceutical industry rubs shoulders. Among others, we see the CEO of Feitzer, the chairman of GlaxoSmithKline, and the CEO of Boiron, three of the world's largest pharmaceutical laboratories. Each has paid 3,000 euros to attend this conference. But amongst those attending, we also find several frontline politicians. Bernard Kouchner, former Socialist Minister of Health. Michel Barzac, the former Minister of Health under the Balladour government. And Claude Evin, the former Minister of Health and now a Socialist Member of Parliament. 
All these people have been brought together by one man, Daniel Vial, the most important lobbyist for the pharmaceutical industry in France. Thanks to him, politicians and major health industrialists can discuss current problems in an informal way. We went to the chateau to ask for an interview with a lobbyist. We were directed to Daniel Vial's assistant. Bonjour. Bonjour. On aurait voulu voir Monsieur Daniel Vial, c'est possible. Oui, bah, pas tout de suite. Il est en train de parler. Donc, euh, on peut, on peut la... C'est c'est presse, euh, pas de presse. Ah. Ouais. C'est la règle du jeu. C'est la règle du jeu. Hmm? Mais je vais aller vous le chercher. Ah ouais, on, on l'attend. Oui. Ok. Monsieur Daniel Vial. In fact, several minutes later, the lobbyists joins us. Écoutez, franchement, je serais ravi de vous répondre. Mais oui. Une heure. Dans une heure. Oui, dans une heure. Je m'en voulais pas, je peux pas. Non, non, mais je veux. Je suis en pleine discussion. Okay, ça marche. Merci. Daniel Vial appears to be in a hurry. He's expecting a VIP guest. And sure enough, a few minutes later, the limousine arrives. Inside is a government minister. It's Philippe Ba, Under Secretary for Social Security and the Minister for Health. He doesn't wish to comment on his presence at the conference. The minister has come especially from Paris to address the meeting. An hour and a half later, he emerges and is no more forthcoming. Monsieur le ministre. Merci beaucoup. Merci de votre accueil. Au revoir. Monsieur le ministre. Un petit mot. Un mot, un mot, un mot. He leaves the same way he came, escorted by two motorcycles. At the Ministry of Health, they inform us that Philippe Barr was there that day on official business. But how did a lobbyist manage to get so many politicians to come to his conference? But how did you get the politicians to come here? Did you pay them? Oh, yeah, we pay them in cash, huge, big, fat envelopes. And he left. Now, oh, what rubbish. No, no, of course not. So they come for free? Oh, but don't ask so many questions. I mean, you're stupid. I mean, it's uh, it's not right. Uh, but this gentleman is asking me if we pay the politicians. Oh, well, that's out of order. No way. Come on. Although the question may amuse Daniel Vial, the relationship between politicians, industrialists and lobbyists remain ambiguous. Michel Bazac, the former Minister of Health, has now become a convert and started his own lobbying firm. More surprising still, during our inquiry, we discovered certain lobbying practices that go close to the limits of legality. At the National Assembly, we put our fingers on a bizarre practice. It doesn't concern the members directly, but their parliamentary assistants. Bonjour, Séverine. Séverine Tessier, assistant to a socialist member, received a very strange fax some time ago. A lobbying firm quite simply offered to recruit her. And here's what they wrote to her. Your experience as a parliamentary assistant has allowed you to gain very considerable experience in political relations. Within the boundaries of your professional etiquette, it would be interesting for our company to benefit from your advice and consultation. Well, a connection between a parliamentary assistant and uh, the lobbyist seems completely incompatible with a minimal level of ethics. There's an obvious conflict of interest between carrying out day-to-day -day duties with uh, the Member of Parliament and, at the same time, being paid by a business to lobby. Uh, it's impossible. We try to find out what exactly this lobbying firm was really suggesting. First, we try to contact them by telephone. Hello. Hello, this is Nicola Bourgoin from Canal Plus. Well, listen, not now. I'm, uh, I don't have the time. I'm, I'm not interested. Why are you not interested? Uh, hold the line, please. Hello, bonjour, monsieur. Yes, hello, sir. I'm a sales executive from... We have never worked with the National Assembly. Uh, so she simply cannot understand. She's never worked with the National Assembly. Never. But uh, I thought your company had sent faxes to all the parliamentary assistants. 
Oh, goodness me, yes. I mean, that goes back to what, two years, a year and a half ago. We did do a male shot. It was a secretary who didn't know what she was doing. In fact, at the time, we carried out a specific search for a member of parliament in order to establish contacts concerning a specific topic. So you're saying that Madam doesn't see parliamentary assistance by appointment? We do not see parliamentary assistance by appointment. And apart from this, come on, be nice and stop calling us because we have work to do. Well, so do I. Well, you work, but I don't know at what. I just know that in the media you're paid to do sod all. Goodbye. So, to earn our wages, we contacted another parliamentary assistant who had also received a fax, Clémentine Lemaitre, the parliamentary assistant to a communist member. With the agreement of her member of parliament, she calls her lobbying office on our behalf. And you will see that when a politician calls, the welcome is very different. At the other end of the line is the same person who had refused to talk to us. Hello. Miss, uh, yes, I'm the assistant uh, of Jean-Claude Lefort, member of parliament for the Val de Marne, and who's a member of the Foreign Affairs Commission. I don't know what sort of clients or what type of assignment you have that might possibly be uh, interested in that service. Is the Foreign Affairs Commission of interest to you or, or not? Yeah, it could be of interest, uh, because we're very varied in our, um, well, in the companies we, we represent. We have a very broad client base, so we're always interested in this sort of thing. Uh, would you like to meet up? Of course, yeah. Well, let's say two o'clock. Okay. Thanks, bye. Clémentine Lemaitre goes to the meeting. She's fitted with a hidden camera. The firm is in a smart district of Paris. It's well established. The offices are behind this frosted window. Bonjour. Here, Clémentine Lemaitre is given a warm welcome. The lobbyist explains what the mission is all about. We can organize, say, lunches at the assembly just to, to meet clients, uh, to expand things, move things along. But will I have to host them? No, I always come with them, uh, or they'll be Audrey or Madame Claude. There's always someone with them. They never go alone. Uh, never alone to a meeting, otherwise it's wham-bang. There are some... Uh, well, we've now managed to channel them. But, but what do you mean it's wham-bam? Well, they don't know how to sell themselves. That's what I was telling you just now. What uh, I'm looking for now is a, is a market. That isn't the way to open a conversation. <laughs> well, they say it just like that. Well, some do, yes. But at the same time, nobody's fooled. Everybody sort of knows. Oh, well, that's it. You should wait at least five minutes before you say it. The lobbyist uses every possible argument to persuade Clémentine Lemaitre to accept the job. Well, it allows you to widen your field of activity to see other things and also make ends meet, which is no small consideration. Well, there you are. Well, especially at election time when quite a few of us will find ourselves... Uh, well, you have to look to uh, the future a little. Uh, by the way, does it matter to you if the member knows about it or not? Uh, naturally, he, he wouldn't be at these meetings. No, naturally, it's, it's really just for you, as, as well as making ends meet. Uh, it's, it's for you. He doesn't need to... No, on the contrary. So if I don't say anything to him, it won't bother you? No, of course not. No, I won't say anything. <laughs> Clémentine Lemaitre's profile interests the firm. On the other hand, it's impossible to find out what she'll be paid. On this subject, the lobbyist remains vague. This sort of proposition seems very much like corruption. And yet, incredible as it may seem, it's perfectly legal. So we want to put the question to the parliamentary assistants. A few days later, at the Senate, they organized a conference on the future of their profession. Their status is precarious, and they often complain of being poorly paid. So the possibility of working for a lobbyist firm in parallel is the subject of the day's debate. Well, there's nothing in our statute to prevent us doing it. It's our contract with our employer that prevents us ethically. 
Well, I'm really shocked that a parliamentary assistant should be under contract to a private firm for, for monitoring legislation. That doesn't fit in with our responsibilities. After the conference, several parliamentary assistants admit that they have already succumbed to the temptation of lobbying. Have they contacted you to do it? Oh, yeah, they've already contacted me, yeah. And how do you respond? Well, as it happened, the, the offers made to me were not for lobbying, but for monitoring. The only time I was offered a contract, uh, but I emphasize once again, not for lobbying, but for documentary research, which I did outside my working hours, was for the pharmaceutical industry. There are people in this job uh, who, are, who are paid just the, the minimum wage. Uh, how can you expect them to refuse five or six hundred euros for some work for another company? I even know parliamentary assistants who have a part-time contract with a member of parliament and work part-time for a major public relations company. Have you ever been loaned out yourself? I've done it myself, yes. I did it from 1999 to 2004. Oh, for, for five years. Yeah, five years. That was okay. According to our information, about a hundred parliamentary assistants are paid by lobbying firms or directly by companies to lobby. And yet more astonishingly, we found lobbyists at the highest levels of the state. During the course of our investigation, we took a great interest in a particularly successful lobbying firm. A stone's throw from the Arc de Triomphe, these offices are situated on the top floor of this classic Haussmann building, Domaine Public. We got hold of this lobbying firm's brochure. You find all sorts of clients, especially the gaming industry, security, tobacco, wines and spirits. Domaine Public is in fact a business name that groups two lobbying firms. One of them is particularly flourishing, PIC Conseil. In one year, its turnover has increased 50%. An extraordinary success, which is the envy of the sector. Among the partners, two men drew our attention. Stéphane Desnoyers and Frédéric Lefebvre. They both work at the Ministry of the Interior. Today, Frédéric Lefebvre, the founder and majority shareholder of PIC Conseil, is close to Nicolas Sarkozy. He is his advisor, responsible for relations between the minister and parliament. And despite all our requests, he refuses to answer our questions. He sent us a letter in which he explains that since he's been at the ministry, he has voluntarily given up all income, either as salary or as dividends, related to his company's activities. But even if he doesn't get any money, Frédéric Lefebvre nevertheless remains the decision-maker for PIC Conseil. As for Stéphane Desnoyers, whom we were not able to film, it's difficult to say what position he occupies at the ministry. So we call Place Beauvau. Mr. Desnoyers' office. Hello, this is Nicolas Bougain from uh, Canal Plus. I'd like to speak to Stéphane Desnoyers, please. Oui. Uh, listen, I've got his voicemail. He doesn't seem to be available at the moment. Uh, would you like to leave a message? Well, I'd like him to call me back. Okay. I'd just like to ask us not to make uh, any mistake if he calls me back. What is his exact position at the ministry? He has no position at the ministry. He has no position. But you're a secretary, yes? He works for Mr. Estrosi or Mr. Sarkozy. He works for Mr. Estrosi or Mr. Sarkozy? No, he doesn't have a position at the ministry. <laughs> so he's just got a secretary. That's nice. Uh, how come? Uh, well, that's a question you should put directly to him. Uh, excuse me, but I've got other calls waiting. The only trace of Stéphane Desnoyers, an old National Assembly directory in which he appears as parliamentary assistant to Christian Estrosi, 
who has since become the Under Secretary for Urban and Country Planning at the Ministry of the Interior. Stéphane Desnoyers also refused to be interviewed. In a letter to us, he confirms that he is a lobbyist with PIC Conseil and that he holds the position of Secretary at the Ministry of the Interior. But according to him, it's a practice that the law allows and which, to his knowledge, is not prohibited by any regulation. One question remains. Should lobbyists with clients in the gaming or security, tobacco and alcohol industries hold a position in the Ministry of the Interior, which deals with those very matters? We tried to find out more, and so we headed to Marseille. It's early September, and the UMP is holding its summer school. All the stars of the party are present. And certain stars of music, like Johnny Holiday, have even made the trip to support their candidate, Nicolas Sarkozy. All the spotlights may be focused on them, but behind the cameras, one man remains in the shadows. Frédéric Lefebvre. Because he's not just Nicolas Sarkozy's advisor, he's also his office manager for the UMP presidency. That's why in Marseille, he's a little like the band leader for these summer schools. We follow him to ask him about his lobbying activities. Excuse me, I'd like to know if uh, Nicolas Sarkozy is aware that you're a majority shareholder in a lobbying firm and that your clients are in tobacco, alcohol and gaming. Well, why don't you want to answer my question, Monsieur Lefebvre? In the crowd, we also discovered Christian Estrosi, the minister that Stéphane Desnoyers, the other lobbyist from PIC Conseil, works with. Uh, Mr. Estrosi, uh, does it seem right to you that one of your advisors, Stéphane Desnoyers, should be a shareholder in a lobbying firm with clients in tobacco, alcohol and gaming? Did you know that? No, absolutely not. You didn't know? No. So what is Mr. Desnoyers' position at the ministry? Christian Estrosi won't say anything more to us either. So we decide to speak to the Minister of the Interior himself, Nicolas Sarkozy. We take advantage of a moment when he manages to extract himself from the crowd. Uh, Mr. Sarkozy, we're making a program about lobbyists. Uh, your advisor, Frédéric Lefebvre, is a major shareholder in a lobbying firm whose clients are in tobacco, alcohol and gaming. Does that uh, seem right to you or not? Well, it's news to me. I, I don't know anything about it. And frankly, it's, it's not my problem. But it's our subject, so it's our problem. Well, if it's your subject, do it. What do you want me to say? Two ministers who tell us they know nothing of the dual activities of their two colleagues. Two colleagues who refuse to talk about their lobbying activities. We won't find out any more. In France, relationships between politicians and lobbyists are particularly opaque. Other countries have chosen total transparency on the activities of lobbyists. That's the option taken by the European Parliament. In Brussels, lobbies are official. They flaunt themselves. Nicolas Ravaille is French. He lives in Brussels. He's a lobbyist, and he's perfectly entitled to enter the European Parliament. Well, I've got that badge. I'm accredited to the European Parliament. It's this badge. It's blue with a red stripe, and that's how you can identify lobbyists. Inside the Parliament, there are no closed zones, no reserved areas. The lobbyist can go where he likes. The members' offices are upstairs, and to get in, you just need to knock on the door. That's uh, an assistant's office. Voilà. Salut Jacques. Bonjour. The first meeting is with a parliamentary assistant of a French Euro member. The meeting will last only a few moments, just time to discuss a proposed law that will soon be voted in Parliament. Fifteen minutes later, another meeting in a nearby office. 
This time it's directly with a member, a French socialist. Hello, Mr. Deputy. Thanks for seeing me. So you want to discuss paragraph 18 that's now been resubmitted. Uh, I submitted it together with your amendment. The lobbyist wants the member to adopt the amendment that he has written entirely himself. The member is not shocked. He doesn't take offence. This sort of practice is frequent in Brussels. Well, if the amendment conforms to the causes that I support, uh, to my own ethics, then it doesn't pose a problem for me, wherever it comes from. It can come from the uh, UMP uh, or the lobbyist, I don't care. What interests me is that it corresponds to the cause that I support. Okay, good luck. Thanks very much. Goodbye. And with his meetings over, the lobbyist goes directly into the room where the parliamentary commission is meeting. This is where they discuss the texts of laws to be voted on. There are no inhibitions. The lobbyist takes his place in the audience. Isn't that a member of parliament seat? No, I'm, I'm sitting in a seat reserved for lobbyists, for consultants, who are allowed to attend the parliamentary commission's work. I'm here to analyze what's happening, uh, what's said, and then I can recontact the members to give the observations uh, that I feel are important. And so, in Brussels, it's impossible to escape the lobbyists, inside parliament as well as out. This looks like a marching band, but in fact, it's a pharmaceutical lobby launching a campaign against tobacco. The message, tobacco makes you blind. <coughs> Today, in reality, the European Parliament is encircled. Lobbying firms from all over the world have set up in the surrounding buildings. They represent all the major economic sectors. And for 10 years, they haven't stopped growing. However, the omnipresence of lobbies in Brussels is starting to grate on the teeth of certain European members. In less than 10 years, the system has exploded. In Brussels today, for every sitting European member, there are no less than seven lobbyists.